you all for being here today. Uh, I think I can speak on John's behalf that it's admittedly a distinct pleasure to uh, be here, this very prestigious event uh, amongst the world's, some of the world's the leading financial services providers and admittedly the emerging fintech companies that uh, we see. Um, félicitations à Finance Montréal, c'est très impressionnant. Congratulations to Finance Montreal. It's uh, lovely to recognize uh, the uh, evolution of the brands in here in Canada, uh, importance that are very important for the Montreal and Quebec communities. And also, uh, because of the uh, Forum, we see that the future is very promising for the technological future of Quebec and Canada. It's. I'm sorry, John, but they, they referred to me as you, and I don't, don't think I could ever <laughs> achieve that level. But uh, I must say that after 22 years of occupying many different uh, positions at the TMX Group, and if I can just name a few, he's Jansman CFO, head of corporate strategy responsible for investor relations. He had the responsibility, and this is quite important for this forum, of the oversight of the capital formation for the TMX Group. Uh, and he also was uh, president of CDS. CDS stands for, for those who don't know, Canadian Depository Services, which is a very important part of the, uh, of the, um, of the exchange business. Uh, John was appointed uh, CEO of the TMX Group over two years ago. Uh, you can imagine what it is to take such a position in the thick of a pandemic, and uh, he did it with uh, extraordinary brio and, and, and class and uh, continued on with the business as if, uh, as if we were in full, full swing. So his depth of experience in the ex exchange space is unquestionably a, uh, uh, a big benefit to uh, Canadian capital markets. Both around the world and in Canada, exchange, uh, the exchange landscapes have uh, significantly changed in the last quarter century. Um, like John, I witnessed firsthand some of these changes, uh, having spent uh, most of my career in financial services and specifically nine years as CEO of the Montreal Exchange, um, and now 11 years uh, of, on the board of the, the TMX Group, which means that I have two years less experience than John. <laughs> um, John's been there for 22 years, as I said. Um, but I also did a short stink, stint, rather, as uh, CEO of the Maple Acquisition Corp. Uh, prior to 1999, and I think this context is important for, for us, uh, Canada was a, essentially a patchwork of different regional exchanges. Uh, just about every major city had an exchange of some sort. Uh, and admittedly, the dynamics changed dramatically, uh, and this was largely because of technology uh, and uh, now we're talking late 90s, early 2000s, and essentially the open outcry environment where we had a floors where people would yell at each other obscenities all day long in the hope of making a market. <laughs> well, that, that went the way of the buggy whip. Uh, so you can appreciate that the challenges of technology for the exchange business has been there with us for a very long time. John has experienced the advent, of course, of all these new technologies and the rapid, rapid uh, globalization of uh, finance around the world. And essentially where exchanges transform themselves from utility-owned members, member-controlled exchange uh, to publicly held for-profit entities. It's just that in itself is a dramatic cultural shift. Uh, and essentially where if you wanted to survive, you needed to innovate and you needed to learn to compete very quickly. So the concept of having a utility that was entrenched and where your franchise was, was, uh, was, was guaranteed simply was not going to, uh, to work. Um, John and I are here to discuss how the TMX group fits into this modern financial landscape, uh, the critical role that the TMX plays in capital formation, risk management, trading and clearing, post-trading services, um, and whether we're talking exchange-traded or over-the-counter products or private equity products, uh, whether it's a derivative uh, instrument or a cash instrument, uh, it's all the same to us. We are the nexus of the capital markets. I want to say us because I'm on the board. Um, but essentially, it's, 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 it's where the TMX plays a role on a daily basis in all those categories of services. 
Uh, and as, like I said, how do these services become central to the public uh, market ecosystem? And specifically, this is to me the most important part of the, our theme is how do we accompany entrepreneurs? And I like to think that essentially the TMX uses technology to help entrepreneurs create new technologies uh, in terms of the capital that is required to get those technologies going. John was recently in uh, Calgary and Vancouver as part of a national in-person engagement tour. So we're really thrilled, John, that you are with us today. It may be a bit odd to have a board member question the CEO in a public platform, but anyway, we're gonna give it a shot. Um, but we both share a passion for the exchange business. Uh, today, uh, this is an ideal opportunity to talk about the TMX, uh, and like I said, in particular, capital formation for the participants in the fintech world. So, hello, John, and bienvenue to Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Luke, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, merci and bonjour à tous. Um, unfortunately, that's as Matter far as my French is going to go today. I apologize for that in advance. Uh, but first of all, thank you so much, you know, Finance Montreal for having us. We're, we're thrilled to be here. And thank you, Luke, for doing this with me today. Um, it's, it's a real treat for me to get to do this with someone who I've actually got to learn so much from in the industry over time and to get to share the stage together to talk about the importance of our markets and what we do for the industry with people that are passionate about it is, is really exciting. Um, you made another point as we went on, and this is really about technology. It's a continuously redefining force in the industry. And as Luke mentioned, you know, TMX Group today owns and operates um, many critical components of the Canadian marketplace. TSX, MX, the Montreal Exchange, TSX Venture, CDS, CDCC, um, every single one of these is a digital business. And we we're joking in the green room earlier that we are actually the oldest FinTech company in the country at 170 years. Um, but it's not the acronyms themselves, it's actually what we do with them that's important for the marketplace um, it's the platforms that raise capital, the, the venues for modern investors to trade and engage in all of these great uh, companies, over 3,000 of them that list with us, and the crucial payment infrastructure that actually makes it all work without anyone actually having to see what happens. Um, you know, obviously, we're, we're very proud of the role we play, play in the organization, play in the industry, play in the marketplace, but it, we recognize that it's actually a position of great privilege and responsibility in terms of what we need to operate. And when we talk again about technology and innovation, though, and again, that we're 107, you know, we used to call ourselves the 150 year old startup, but now we're the 170 year old fintech. Um, you think about the record of innovation that's come from the Canadian market operators, and this is unique in the world. We were the very first, Toronto Stock Exchange was the very first computer assisted trading system back in 1977. 20 years later, the first fully electronic stock exchange in North America when we closed the trading floor. Uh, we actually invented the exchange traded fund in Canada. For those for people that don't know that, it was named of one of the top 150 innovations by Globe and Mail. And since that time, 1990, ETF industry has grown throughout the world. And today we've gotten you know, over 900 ETFs that are actually listed on our exchange with over 300 billion in assets. And last year, we launched the very world's very first Bitcoin and Ether ETF. Again, first in the world to do this and a sign of that continued innovation. The Montreal Exchange, our, our partner in the family, was the first fully electronic futures market, futures and option market in North America when they closed the trading floor in 2000. And the underlying technology of SOLA, uh, which was built and developed right here in Montreal in 2005, is still the core architecture today that runs both the Montreal Exchange and powers other marketplaces around the world, like the Boston Option Exchange south of the border. So it's a core to what we do, is to innovate for the marketplace. Um, but the other big change, and this is where I'm going to take my glasses off because now Shane knows that I'm going off script. Um, we have become an innovation market ourselves. So TSX was long known and TSX Venture was long known for mining, for resources, for energy, which is what we were talking about when we were out, la out west the last week. But in the last five years, we've gone from being 5% of the mix of the companies on the marketplace being tech to at the end of last year was 14 and for the first time rivaled and was bigger than the mining sector. So even though that history of being known as the mining exchange, technology is the biggest growth area in terms of what's underpinning the future. And core to the purpose of what we're trying to do as an organization, our focus on making markets better and empowering bold ideas to be there to finance those entrepreneurs so they can create the technology of tomorrow. 
just like we have been through our 170 year history to be the partner of industry to finance all the great innovation development that's happened throughout country. And if you think about our history, we financed the railways, the communication sector, the banking system, everything that built the country over time. And we're gonna do that for the foreseeable future going forward. Um, so with that, I will stop the intro remarks, Luke, and, and hand it back to you. Thank you. All right, thank you, John. Thank you for that intro. Um, very fundamental question for certainly for many people in this room and who are listening to us uh, by video. John, why should an emerging tech company choose a public listing? I think this is a great question to start with. And, and we are never going to be the ones to say that you should or should not pick a public listing. It's going to depend on the conditions of the company. But what we have found through our history, particularly running the junior capital market, is for many companies, they actually can do a better capital raise and more future capital raises with the public facility than sometimes they can in the private facility. Sometimes on a private space, you've got escalating expectations around valuation that make the next round hard. The public model actually can allow some more innovation and the flexibility. And what's unique in Canada, and this is a piece that, you know, one of the reasons we're out talking, what's unique in Canada that we do better than anywhere else in the world is a junior public venture market, where a junior company can actually raise public capital on exchange in a vehicle that's private equity backed, but with the liquidity of a retail shareholder base. And sometimes the questions are, well, why would I want to be public with all that regulatory uh, burden of being a public company? What we've tried to do in the market is actually right size it. So the regulatory structure on a junior market is different. It's lighter, it's more fit per purpose. And secondly, the exchange, the TSX Venture Exchange, actually works with the companies directly to help mentor them and train them in terms of what does it be to mean to be a good public company. So we help with disclosure, we help with ESG, we help with investor relations to ease that transition from being the pure private world to public. But the last piece I'll add is we don't see ourselves as being a public market only. Our job is to help companies raise capital. And so we also have solutions to help them raise capital in the private space. We operate one of the largest trust companies. We actually operate a deal network for financing private companies. And we think that's part of the whole ecosystem. Any company in this country, or even the international companies that we support that need to raise capital, we're looking to provide solutions to ease the ability to do that. Thank you. Um, moving on here. Um, what, what, what is a TMX strategy for, for, for developing a better marketplace, a more robust marketplace, and where capital formation is, uh, is uh, you know, as fluid as possible, notwithstanding you know, the regulatory functions that are critical to the process, of course, or government policy that sometimes comes and complicates things. But maybe give us your perspective on, uh, on, on for, for, for our Canadian capital markets and attracting international financing as well. What's, your, what's the strategy at the TMX? Yeah, I'm happy to. And that's actually why we're doing these discussion points around the world. So you know, we're mostly talking today, um, but another great mentor once told me we've got you know, two ears and one mouth for a reason. So twice as much listening as talking. Um, so we'll, we'll do more listening later on. And we're doing client engagements today for exactly that reason, is we need to hear from the different stakeholders of what's it going to take to continue to modernize the market. And I'm getting a tremendous amount of feedback across the board on the things that we can do, plus the things that we can influence. And if I put it into three simple buckets, there are things within our own model because we set the listing rules, we set the processing, the way a company comes to market where we can find ways to automate and streamline, even just at the beginning of COVID. And I would say this was a formidable foresight we had about COVID coming in, but it wasn't, we were just lucky. Um, we automated all the capabilities for a listed company to go public. And so all that's done digitally now, that used to be paper-based and it was actually more cumbersome. So we're trying to facilitate it and make it easier for a company to reach the public market where we can, we want to streamline our rule base. We've just gone public with a program called Venture Forward. And if you haven't seen it, I'd encourage anyone to look that's engaged in the capital markets because what we're looking for is the ideas people have and how we make the markets more accessible to the future and take some of that regulatory burden off or automate it where we can to streamline the ability for companies to raise capital. We've already had, I think, 500 submissions in terms of ideas that have come from the market in terms of how we can make it better. So those are things that are in our control to drive. But we also have a powerful voice to play with the regulators to, to identify where there's regulatory burden that slows capital raising down. Because let's, let, I mean, let's be fair and candid, every new regulation came in for a good purpose, but the collective burden of them has unintended consequences. 
And it's reasonable to look back and say, does it all still make sense? Does this all still have that value? Some of our regulations are pre-internet around disclosure, and certainly we can use more um, streamlined electronic tools for things like disclosure to ease the burden on companies. I've asked the question of some of the regulators, you know, why don't we allow companies to report every six months if they are a small cap company? Their stories don't change every quarter. Let's let them spend more time focusing on building their business, less time working on disclosure. And then the third leg is we've got a voice to, to, to advocate at the government level and ensuring that public markets have a level playing field with the private market. So advocating for research and development tax reform so that a small public company can get the same benefit as a private company to invest in R&D, expand and grow. We're looking at that. We're looking at things like flow through shares to make it easier for companies to add scale and capacity, particularly in the clean tech and new energy sectors. And so those are the types of things that we can advocate for and we can be a voice for the industry. And what we need to hear is what are those core priorities and get a collective will together with us to help raise that voice so it's not just us. Excellent, thanks. Just moving on more on a, on a more macro basis, if I may, how does the TMX market um, stock up next to competitors or against peers? And uh, not here in North America only, but uh, Asia and Europe. Yeah, I mean, and especially in a forum like this, because in a forum like this, this is a great question because everyone thinks tech NASDAQ. Now, I, I understand that, uh, but when we think about how we stack up globally, um, TMX is one of the top 10 markets in the world. But when you flip it into venture markets, small cap markets, because two thirds of our companies are actually small and mid cap enterprises. We are the number one small cap work in, market in the world, hands down. And we're the only market in the world that's actually figured out how to do it with the entire ecosystem of stakeholders that are going to support small cap public companies lawyers, investors, analysts, banking community. It's the whole collective ecosystem that makes it work. And there's a lot of markets that have tried this. Um, ASX has tried it, AIM has tried it. There's been some small cap attempts in the US through the OTC, but none of them are done as well as our public market vehicle. So that's a really unique advantage. And the proof in the pudding is that is actually we are number two in the world for the number of listed companies, even though Canada is only 2% of the global economy. And then when it comes to international companies that will come and list on another marketplace, we are number two in the world for that. And so far this year, we're number one in net new listings. And really is around small technology companies that's been the driving force in that. So we focus on markets around the world where junior tech can really only get financed in the private market or the OTC. And we present them the option of the public venture option to raise capital. And so we've got about 270 plus international companies that now list here Half of them are from the US. A lot of them are from Silicon Valley. Um, one of the big draw points is actually from Israel. Um, Israel's a fantastic tech market, but their market is too small to finance larger companies. And their, and their companies are often not big enough to get success on NASDAQ. So there's a sweet spot there for us to finance them. We put on the ground resources in Israel two years ago. We've got 17 listings out of that market already that have successfully raised capital in Canada. The dual benefit of doing that is when we do that, we also bring new investors to Canada that want to invest in technology businesses. And we, and we create more ecosystem support for the analysts that are going to cover it. So that's a piece we're going to continue to do. We just added another uh, business development resource in Texas, because Texas is now also another big innovation hotbed. And we're going to see more listings come from that market to Canada as well. Um, just moving on to a very different subject, you, you mentioned in, in your opening remarks uh, that uh, TMX uh, had issued the first crypto ETF, I believe. And um, so, but on a, on a broader basis, um, blockchain, crypto technology, um, they, they, they um, uh, you know, they had extraordinary growth. And then now we're currently experiencing, of course, a uh, a pretty serious slowdown in, in those those spaces, but the, but but for this group, um, setting aside the gyrations of, of the, these markets, can you can you give us your thoughts on the fundamentals of these technologies and mm -hmm. what they may do to the capital markets or the financial markets in general? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And I, I remember actually I was doing a media piece and I got asked. The quote was: "They said well, I've been talking to a professor and he says that blockchain is going to make exchanges irrelevant." Um. And my response was, I said, well, that's usually the comment we get from people that doesn't actually understand how the market structure works. We spent probably the last 10 years deeply engaged in, in blockchain, looking at where it could apply to the ecosystem, where you could use it to actually make the market better. 
And I mean, the simple conclusion, at least on the technology base, for the core infrastructure of running an actual exchange or running a clearinghouse, um, it's actually not really fit for purpose. Um, I got misquoted in, in the Australian paper for saying it wasn't suitable for exchanges, and that wasn't what I meant. But, but in the exchange itself, on the Toronto Stock Exchange, we will sometimes do as many as 10,000 plus messages a, sec a second. You need proprietary central technology to be able to process that kind of trading activity at that kind of speed with the resilience and reliability that the market expects. And on the clearing side, while blockchain can allow you to clear real time, you can clear real time on 20 year old mainframes too, but clearing real time is not what the industry needs because clearing real time means you need to put your money up front on every single trade. And right now we give them the, because we can centralize, we actually give the industry a substantial streamlining benefit where we can actually take a hundred billion dollar worth of trading a day and net that down into 10 billion. And so if you are I trading, we're not trading that hundred dollars 10,000 times. We'll just do it once at the end of the day on a net position. That makes the market so much more efficient. Um, but where we go from here is looking at how do we use this infrastructure to facilitate new asset classes or new technology based asset classes. So as Bitcoin and Ether and others have matured, um, and I think actually if you've been watching what's been going on in the market this week with some of the crypto platforms that haven't been sustainable and what that means for their clients, this is a place where an organization like ours can, have, can provide real value. And so two places we're looking at where we can help the industry is on futures on crypto. So we've got asset managers that are putting crypto into ETFs, into their funds. If we add a future on the Montreal exchange that's based on those same indices, we can give them the risk management tools that they need that they don't get otherwise. And it uses all the existing infrastructure that they're already connected to. We believe, and we're testing out right now with clients, that we can actually do the same thing for actual crypto trading. So rather than having to trade it through wallets or unregulated platforms, you could actually be able to trade it on an exchange, cleared centrally through a clearinghouse, settled with the same kind of connectivity, resiliency, transparency, and security that we expect of securities that are regulated. This is a market that's going to be regulated. The regulation is coming. And, and I believe from the regulators we've talked to, they would love to see us providing more automation in this market to take you know, what's been going on in the more decentralized world and have it work in the central architecture that again is fast, efficient, and reliable. Uh, maybe time for two more questions. I think we've got about five minutes left. Um, I'd like to have your thoughts on the fact that, we, you know, the rise in interest rates that we've had recently, um, and admittedly, uh, we've experienced a decline in IPOs in, in the last year. There's been all sorts of other forms of financing, but at a lesser pace. Uh, but against that background, uh, what, how, what, what are your thoughts moving forward? Uh, assuming an interest rate environment that stays where it is right now or a little higher, give or take. Uh, what does that mean to capital formation in the public markets? Yeah, it's such an important question, especially coming off last of, of this year, where we're seeing, I mean, the new cycle is that the IPOs are not here this year. Um, and I actually think it missed, that's only half the story. Because again, the uniqueness of the Canadian market, because we can finance small cap companies through the venture exchange, uh, we have something called a capital pool company program, which is actually founder based private equity is in it. You, you don't need to do the full public offering process. Um, we've actually been growing the number of public listings this year, which no one would expect in this market to hear the IPOs are gone. We're actually increasing the number of public listings for the fifth year in a row. On the financing side, yeah, the large financings aren't going to aren't, haven't been there, but that increase in interest rates. In any other market cycle we've been through before, the expectation is at some point companies are going to come back to the equity market to raise capital because it's actually going to be more cost effective than raising five, six, seven, eight percent debt. And as balance sheets need to get refinancing, the equity market is going to play a really important role in doing that. What it also means for companies is we had a number of companies that were ready to go to raise capital early in the year. A lot of technology companies as well. And when valuations came off, you know, those deals got set aside. When there's confidence in the market comes back, you will start to see deal follow deal. And that's what I've always seen in my experience is that once a couple of really good transactions can get done, it gives others the confidence to ride on the back of that and bring their deals to market. But we also recommend to companies that you also don't need to do it all in one transaction. That's really the value of the public market is you can do a small financing now, get the public liquidity, 
do the expansion you want to do and come back to the market again with that track record and raise money again in 18 months, two years time to build the business over time. It's actually a much better way to build that sustaining market presence than to do a great big deal all at once and never come back to the market again. So I do think that um, 2023 could be a really interesting year. I don't have the crystal ball to say when it'll start, uh, but with that pent up demand of companies that are gonna need to raise capital and the competitiveness of the equity market with compared to high fixed income rates, um, this is gonna be a potentially really interesting market. The piece I also bring people back to, you know, we talked about how kind of, you know, 14% of the business, it's a little lower now of our evaluations that are tech. Um, we've, we keep a pipeline now. We keep a pipeline of private companies that we're engaged with that could raise public money with, money with us in the future. We build that relationship in advance because we don't want a public, a potential public company to only have to learn about the exchange when it's time to do their financing. Uh, they want, we want to make sure they understand what the opportunity is as they're raising capital throughout their history, throughout their growth cycle. In that pipeline of potential companies, we have 1,600 companies that we've got active dialogue with. Over 800 of them are technology-based companies. Um, even in the Montreal market today, where we've got over 200 companies listed out of Quebec, a quarter of them are technology-based companies. So it's not only is it a big piece of the market now, it's the biggest piece of the potential companies that are gonna finance in the future. And when the market conditions stabilize so they can get good valuation, we're gonna see those companies come back to market. Well, that's <clears throat> key because we, we all know that ultimately um, capital is the plasma for growth. And uh, I think one important message you're also referring to is it takes, it takes some time, lead time for companies to prepare to become uh, mm -hmm. publicly traded uh, entities. And that's the message that we, we often hear. Um, just one quick last question. We got a minute and, and a few seconds left. Uh, and uh, I, I was debating whether it's a ten on a proper, on, on a happy note or not, but I'll, ask, I'll go ahead with it. How do you see the government, government policy impacting capital formation? I know it's a really broad stroke, but just in a quick nutshell. Um, this is an area we're going to push harder. And we know that the government wants to invest in technology. They want to invest in sectors like clean tech. We want to make sure they invest in such a way that also promotes the use of the public market so that these companies can scale up. So there's certain things that we're asking for. If government money is going to go into Canadian companies, Canadian innovation companies, let's have them list in Canada because then Canadian investors can participate in the success of the company their tax dollars are actually going into. That's number one. Number two, other things that we've talked about are things like R&D tax credits, flow through shares. These are vehicles the government can use to really stimulate growth in these sectors. If you take risk away for investors, then more capital will flow in. But the last piece, and I don't mean this to be a negative knock or a negative way to finish, but is let's be careful about new, new taxes that actually stifle growth. So announcements around things like a 2% tax on share buybacks, that's actually not an effective policy for stimulating the public market because it's actually reducing the flexibility for public companies. And it's only applying to public companies and not private companies. So that's the last thing we wanna do because that just creates another barrier for companies to raise public money. We wanna look at reducing those barriers so they can access public money and Canadian investors can participate in those successes. So those are the three things I'd focus on going forward. All right. Thank you very much, John. Alors, je pense que tout le temps qu'on a pour aujourd'hui. Thank you very much for your attention. I think this was all the time we had today. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Luc, Jean. After you. We're going to make a quick change and we'll get, all we're right. going to go with the next. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes. All right. So we're just going to make a quick, quick change. And uh, we're going to have, yeah. Yeah, there you go. We're going to have uh, Mr. Adam Fileski, co-founder and CEO of Portage, and Frederic Lalonde, founder and CEO of Hopper, to come on stage for the second part of this conversation. And it's going to be uh, a, a discussion about redefining travel. So we're just making a quick, quick change. Good, good to go. Let's go. Adam, Frederic. Fred, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's fun. We're both gray-haired yes, fintech guys. Yes. I'm Does a year it... away from those glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm holding out. <laughs> One of our values at Portage is humility. So I'm going to be humble in front of this audience. 
we had the opportunity to invest in your company at the height of COVID and we didn't. And what a mistake that was. So uh, there's my humble uh, admission to this audience. Um, I wanna go back to Fred doing the first pitch for Hopper. You leave the room. My guess is a lot of the partners were sitting around the table like myself, and were saying, wow, there's a lot of competition. There's tons of margin compression. Why does this make sense at all? Tell me a little bit about how you overcame those obvious objections. Yeah, I mean, the real answer is we didn't. Most people passed on us, right? Like all, all of Sand Hill Row. And, and it, when you look back at it, it made a lot of sense not to invest in that narrow sense because it's a consolidated space. You have Booking.com that's like a, you know, a pyramid of granite that owns everything. You have Expedia that's consolidated everything. And you know, from the outside, if you know nothing about the category, you go, well, what is the disruption? What can you really do here? Sure, they're forecasting flight prices, but can they become really big? Today, we're 12% of everything sold uh, through third party in, in the US, 20% of our business is global, we do about 5 billion of top line, and that's doubling every year. Um, so we're in most, for most suppliers, we're their number two travel agency. And I would love to tell you we were geniuses and we had this plan, we just stumbled our way through it as best we could. Um, and the, the one thing is we found early on people that were willing to back the idea behind it. And so, you know, and, and our getting was far from stellar. We took six years to launch anything. And this was the years of lean startup where you're supposed to launch in six weeks. People were throwing rocks at me in the street, right, for what we were doing. But we, we had this fundamental belief that if you aggregated data in this category, you could innovate on it. And really, um, there, were, there were a couple of pivotal moments, but the one that turned us from a good idea to a really you know, fast growing, you know, revenue generating company was the financial products. Um, and, and we had this aha moment a bit before the pandemic. And to be quite honest about it, um, the year of the pandemic was, was horrible because everything got canceled, all the planes got grounded. And so we, you know, we had like 500,000 people wanted a refund on the same day. So it was a really dark year, but we built some of the best infrastructure in our history in that year because we had no customers. So if you look at us from a financial perspective, um, it's the transition to the financial services, which make up almost 50% of our revenue. We make more money not selling travel than we do selling travel. I think, and I got some pretty good data, that you may be the largest fintech in Canada by revenue. It's a pretty amazing transition. That sounds about right. It's, it's, it's really incredible. And the theme of the conference today has all been about embedded finance and that any platform is going to have a fintech component. And I think you've, you've proven that. I think what's also super interesting, and correct me if I'm wrong, but now with your evolution and progress of being able to convert on financial services, you can use travel, which is your original product and platform and why people come to come to Hopper as a lock leader. Yeah. And so like, what is a, how does a booking.com react or an Expedia react to you? Yeah, that's, that's been the interesting thing is that fundamentally, you know, air is like the worst business in the world. Well, crypto is the worst business in the world. <laughs> but like air is the worst business in the world after crypto. And <laughs> fundamentally um, what, what you get is maybe a 2% you know, take rate, and it's going to cost you two and a half to service the customers, right? And so you make it up on volume, right? Like it's it's horrible. At Hopper, we have between twelve and fourteen percent take rate, and that's coming from the customer um, because we are creating value add products. And so we have a weird definition of fintech, and I think the only reason I'm allowed to be here is because we take risk, right? Le the reason it's a financial product is we we do all sorts of things, like we. We protect you against prices going up. We protect you against uh, misconnection. We let you change a ticket. Um, we even let you leave a hotel room if your wife hates it. That's actually a product that we have. And fundamentally, <laughs> all that risk is on my PL, and we, we're a giant programmatic risk pool, right? And we have you know hundreds of millions of this stuff out there. And so that's our fundamental model behind it. But what's interesting is if you look at what we do, when somebody comes to Hopper, they spend an average of 12 to 15 percent more than they would if they bought the same travel stuff on you know expedia a.com marriott whatever and so you might say well what's how does that matter well travel fully recovered 1.6 trillion mm -hmm. so if you do a thought experiment and say if we had the same 
consumer offerings available on every website, corporate leisure, everywhere in the world, that's anywhere between 200 and $400 billion of unrealized customer spend. That is, that is a huge amount of money. That's not the TAM of travel. That's just you know people putting more money on their card. And you go back to 1994 when Travelocity sold the first ticket, except for the pandemic, the average order value index for inflation mm. has been the same. So everybody's been fighting over the same pie. You know, Google buys ITA and they get more and TripAdvisor gets invented and I give them some more when I'm expedient. But nobody's ever unlocked new spend except Airbnb. And so now we're sitting on this stack where we could be hyper profitable, but what we decided to do is say, well, travel is very expensive. I think Sam Walton got it right, everyday low prices. So we use the FinTech margins in our leisure business to subsidize the price of travel. And by doing that, we went from 1% market share pre-pandemic to 12. And we've taken that away from Expedia and booking. And so, you know, it's not that hard to explain why that happened. Can you speak a little bit as you're going through this transition, you have the aha moment like what did you think about from a perspective internal talent acquisition like you're like holy shit i need someone in insurance or you know i need that banker guy how did you retool to prepare for this no bankers <laughs> <laughs> i can tell you that <laughs> no um so we did something super odd too in the beginning is when we were tiny eight people we had four in boston and we had four in montreal so i live in montreal i live on the mountain as you know um but you know, Canada's great, Quebec's great, we just don't have the depth of the big markets, right? You, if you look at the data science community in Boston or in California, there's no equivalent anywhere in Canada. So there's there's just as many start, smart people, but there's just more of them in these markets. So my position was very, very simple. We're gonna open up a block away from the MIT because what matters is not the job creation in tech, it's the value creation. And I, I saw no reason why an MID PhD wouldn't work for a Canadian company. And so we, we just worked that as hard as we could. Um, and what we got over the, the you know, almost decade of doing that is an amazing field of very young, very product data oriented leaders. And we, we pay them extremely well. We, we give a lot of the company's equity away. We're evergreen on the stock grants, all these things that you're supposed to do. And when the company got big, we just had this really deep bench of very young people. And so what we did instead of following the advice of every VC, oh, you got to get these white, you know, haired guys in and all that kind of stuff. We just took our most talented people and say, go run this $1 billion business. And yes, I know you're 24, but you'll figure it out, which is what happened to me when I joined Expedia. They gave me a PL and and you know, when I was in my 20s. And I cannot tell you how mm. important that was to creating the differentiation because Hopper runs at a product cadence that the other CEOs can only be jealous of. And I know this because they told me, right. and it's because we were engineered as a customer first product, first company, and we take enormous risk on, on young talent. And one of the things that that does is it connects you with what the next generation of consumers want. I'm, you know, we're right. way too old, we, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> to understand what's happening on TikTok. But a lot of the people that work at Hopper are from that generation and that's right. given us a huge edge. The other thing you've done, and I'm guilty of this sitting in, in many boardrooms, when a founder comes and their company's doing well and direct to consumer and they say, guess what? We've got a great opportunity in B2B enterprise. Yeah. This yeah. is going to be awesome. The first thing we say is like, what are you nuts? Like that is a completely different go to market. You need a completely yep. different talent set yet. During the pandemic, you also launched a B2B yes. enterprise business yes. that's now like amazingly successful and congratulations on the announcement with capital one T -t tell us about that because that wasn't supposed to work either yeah that's another one of the the crazy pivot moments um so for scale today um our b2b business which is making the fintech um components available to anybody who sells travel which goes back to that town thesis i was talking about two minutes ago um is as large as our entire business last year right and so and this is hundreds of millions of revenue, as you point out, billions of sales and all that. Um, so honestly, I'd love to say, again, we're really clever, but the first customer that came to us for that was Capital One. And for like four years, like the, you know, the, the CEO of Capital One would call and say, please do our travel. And I was like, go away. <laughs> so, it's like, and so because of that reasoning that you were yeah. explaining, right? And fundamentally, at some point, we realized that they're an exceptional company. And if anybody who knows Capital One, like, 
for a bank or for any company that size, they're exceptional. And we, we said, okay, we'll give it a try. Let's see what we can do. Um, but we weren't going to do it for one customer. We said, okay, the thesis has to hold up. And a lot of what we do at Hopper is Bezosian. So mm -hmm. one of the things we did when we got bigger is we needed to start to do many things at the same time. And if you've worked with startups, that's really hard. Your organization basically attacks innovation like a cancer very early on. As soon as you have 100 people, people hate change. It all kicks in. So we used a lot of the thinking that allowed Amazon to go from where they were in 2001, 2002, roughly our size to the monstrous company they are now, um, which is, you know, decrease the communication, give autonomy. You have to do a lot of crazy things to do this. But fundamentally, in that philosophy, and you could read the shareholder letters if you're interested in, you know, how crazy Jeff Bezos is, it's all online, you can read it. Um, one of the things that's in there is none of that outside thinking matters. What matters is what does the customer want? Can you make money? Mm -hmm. And if you actually are able to simplify your thinking to, is there a customer? Can I make money? And you don't worry about all the strategy and all this other stuff. You're connected to something that's true. Mm -hmm. And so I called a lot of my buddies and I said, if I could make you 15% free money, you know, by, with this product, would you buy it from me? And I'll split it 50, 50. And it's funny because Somebody was pointing out, Elon Musk is trolling people on Twitter, including Stephen King, asking if they would pay $20 for the check mark or eight. I don't know if you, there's this <laughs> fundamental thing that CEOs forget to do, which is just meet a customer and ask yeah. them if they would pay for it. And so we work with extreme customer focus. And, you know, through this thinking, Amazon invented AWS accidentally right. 10 years before Google and Microsoft. Right. So we follow that because I think it's the right way to run a growth company. Super interesting. Uh, you talk about publicly wanting to be kind of the leading super app of travel uh, globally. Um, and, and you want to do that. And we talked about it in the green room from a product led growth yep. perspective and, and, and social commerce is become a huge theme for you and an area of focus. Maybe explain to the audience, what do you, how do you think about social commerce? What, how do you think about the importance of product-led growth? Uh, and then we can go from there. I mean, social commerce is its own thing. And we might have some examples um, of crazy bunnies and slides like that. If we throw them up, I can kind of go through it. So um, about two years ago, maybe a year and a half, 100% um, of our paid spend was on social networks. So I was TikTok's largest customer in North America. We were the largest customer for Facebook out of Canada, a couple hundred millions of spend. You have to know in our category, I think Expedia and Booking spend together 8 billion on Google, right? So we are still tiny, but we were the largest social, you know, uh, candidate there. And so I'm giving hundreds of millions to Mark Zuckerberg to get a Gen Z person to click on in, an Instagram picture. And then somebody shows me pin duo duo. Um, and I, you know, I always do this at conferences, raise your hand if you know what pin duo duo is like, so I get, yeah, so there's maybe, we're well, going to say 100 people in this room to raise their hand, raise your hand if you have it installed, right? And we get one person. Raise, yeah. <laughs> and so pin duo duo is the second largest e commerce company on the planet. And nobody in the West knows what it is, right? And that's because what, what has happened, in my opinion, in the past decade is the East, China first, but all of Southeast Asia has evolved past the West in terms of mobile commerce, in terms of social media. And I, I submit um, ByteDance and, and Xi'an as examples, right? And so we personally believe that the correct way to build Western commerce apps is to emulate what's happening in the East, right? And what is happening in the East now is a lot of these of these companies have said, well, rather than paying somebody to click on an ad, why don't I give the customer something free? And so you can see this, um, you know, if you book with somebody else, you both get $25. You have all these crazy things. You can come and water a plant and accrue credit. Um, you can play micro games. Um, I think we have a, this is going to work. Yeah. Um, a, a bunny paw where you scratch things. Um, there's a mission where you go through the app and you complete things. Um, we have a raffle. So we, about two months ago, we did um, a raffle where we were giving out pinatas and you would <laughs> buy them like a digital product. 
And the day we did that, we sold more digital pinatas than airline tickets. I mean, like <laughs> tens of thousands of them because inside the virtual pinata, and of course the bunny would come and beat it up with a stick and the stuff would fall out. But inside the pinata that you paid $7 for, um, you would get $100 worth of supplier funded coupons and discounts. Um, we have a Duolingo like check-in, uh, Westerners recognize it. So you come in every day and you earn money. Um, and so it turns out that of course, there's a whole generation that only understand the world this way, but everybody likes free money, right? Like, and what the biggest problem that we have as a company is you can go buy the travel stuff everywhere. Uh, I'm a complete commodity marketplace. And Airbnb doesn't have this problem because the thing is only listed, it's called an Airbnb. That's wonderful. I would love to be that. But I'm selling the same Air Canada flight as everybody. But if you go in and you scratch the paw and you play this, um, what ends up happening is you create something called mounting loss. I now have accumulated $40 of credit in the Hopper app. If I go book direct, I don't, can't use it. It's that simple. And then more recently we did this. And so we, three months ago, we shut down all of our marketing spend. We basically have no more functional paid spend. If you take your phone out right now and scan that code, I'll give you $10. You will, you will get $10 on your phone usable in the app right now. And now people are starting to do this. And then if you go and you, you'll get a code, right? And if you go and share your code, you can earn up to $6,000 of credit. Basically, you can travel for free if you post enough stories about this. So we released this a month ago. We're now the number one travel app in Spain, in Italy, and in Colombia. And so what we're doing here is instead of just taking the, the fintech and giving it to you in app to book, we're giving it to you to grow our company. And I would much rather give you the money than Mark Zuckerberg, right? <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg doesn't need $6,000, right? And so this sounds like it's so crazy, but in China, this is table stakes. Every company in Asia operates this way. And thus my thesis that, you know, I think a lot of the Western founders would do good to look East to figure out what their growth model should be. And with this comes an amazing, uh, huge amount of data and you know how much is your data advantage part of the bread and butter of why you're succeeding and and how permanent do you think that is so there's two parts to it the the six years of wandering the jungle building <laughs> hopper and making no money was all about aggregating the supplier data and so today we still have one of the largest archives of historic data. We have 10 years of data of every flight that's ever been shopped in the world outside of China. And when you think of what we do on our fintech side is we underwrite risk. So we go and say, oh, um, you need 24 hours to make up your mind. If you want to book this flight, I will hold it for you for 24 hours. And to do that, I will charge you 20 bucks, 40 bucks. Now, when I get it wrong and the airline raises the price, I, I pay out hundreds of dollars to Air Canada, to Marriott, because we, you know, to Avis. And so the only way I can make money is to not be wrong too much, right? Um, but if I have a large risk pool of millions of people and you all give me $40, well, that's like your car insurance, right? Super profitable business. So all of our fintech revenue is underwritten by our data. That's statement number one, right? That's the most important thing um, to get the company to where it is today. If you look at the future, and again, go install Pinduoduo or Lazada or any of these social commerce apps, uh, Key to Belly, um, any of these things. One thing they do better is you open the app and you immediately see all sorts of products that are hyper relevant to what you're interested in. And one thing that just I find unbelievable is if you think of all the travel apps, it's all you have to search. There's no, there's no predictive commerce in there, which again, you would get laughed out of the room in mm -hmm. China if you said, actually, I'm gonna make people search in a bar, right? That's just, that's just like cavemen do that out there. <laughs> and so fundamentally, what we've accrued now is if I can get you to check in and you know scratch something with a paw or click on something, I'm actually getting closer and closer to collecting your intent. And there are Asian apps that will pay you real money to scroll for one minute. And so these guys understand the world in a completely different way. And why? Because I'm gonna collect the data on what you're tapping on while you're doing right. that. So we are obsessed with high frequency, high depth consumer data, because we think that if we can actually collect the 
pricing data, which we already have, and match that with the intent data, then it's game over. Yeah. Nobody can touch us. That's that's amazing. I can and tell the audience, and I think there's some carriers here. And one of my value propositions that I thought I could bring to to Hopper was like, hey, you know, we've got a lot of capacity in our ecosystem, and this will be great. And you're like, no, my underwriting is so good, I self insure. So, I think that speaks to your your, your data advantage. Um, why don't we change gears a little bit more personal from Hopper? Um, you've gone through quite a journey, um, uh, you know, from COVID to other things. What would be the attribute that you know you would you know, it's always difficult to self-reflect, but if you were saying to a, a fellow entrepreneur, like, this is the attribute that helped me get through this, because um, it wasn't necessarily obvious over no, this many years. Um, I mean, this is, I also have a different view on this than a lot of people, and I'm, I'm finding myself as I get older, a lot of people are coming, you know, can you, can you give advice to this other founder we have in the portfolio? And I, I try to do it as much as possible, because damn, it's hard, right? So like, you know, having somebody give you a few tips helps a lot. Um, and so what I've realized about myself, but also like I know a lot of guys that made a lot of money and, you know, they've been successful. And I've seen, you know, generations of guys try something, fail and, you know, just give up on it. Like being a founder is, is, is not something you do. It's, it's who you are, right? They call it serial founder. And that sounds a lot like serial killer. It is almost <laughs> a mental illness because like, the people that I know are the best at this, they just they just don't understand doing anything else. People are like, oh, it got hard. And it's like, yeah, but I'm still going to do it. Like, you would do it for free. You would do it underwater. You would like, so it, there's a subset of the population, which I'm part of, that just doesn't understand having a job and paying a mortgage or anything like that. And honestly, the people that really built the great companies are either extremely lucky because the first thing they built went to billions of dollars and often the second thing they do or the second idea they have is kind of crap meta right <laughs> so or they're these founders that have failed for a, a while or got a, you know a quick win and they go at it over and over and over right. again um and the ones where i find there's this irrational passion like nothing makes sense they they don't even understand why they're doing it it's this instinctive drive the same thing that an art a true artist has mm -hmm. right why did you know my favorite quote about this is the first time jackson pollock did a drip painting he was in his garage you know smoked a lot of weed and then put the thing down mm -hmm. and did and his wife was actually a much more famous artist accomplished and he asked her to come to the garage and he asked her one question and it was is this art because he himself didn't even understand what he'd done. And mm. the, fundamentally, when you're building a tech company, you have to build it for a world that doesn't exist yet, right? The famous quote, you know, skate where the puck is going in yeah. Canada, which is falsely attributed to Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. It's Wayne Gretzky's dad that said it about his kid. Just mm. I want to correct that because <laughs> Steve Jobs stole it, like a lot of other things. But the, fundamentally, <laughs> what you're doing is you're trying to build a company for a world that doesn't exist yet. Yeah. And so when you're going out and trying to explain to an investor what you're doing, if it makes sense, it's not going to work. Right. So the, the mental disposition you need is, I think, innate. You can't learn that. Right. David Fiacco from General Catalyst uh, makes his partners put 20 bucks in a jar if anyone asks about the TAM of the opportunity. Thank you. Which <laughs> Thank I also... you. Please do that. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I love. Um, we're going to open up for questions in, in one minute. I just want to end... Paul asked uh, Harley uh, on Monday night, you, you know, what, what's your, what do you want your legacy to be? And he said, I'm 38 years old. Let's not talk about <laughs> legacies, but maybe as a Montreal or tell me about kind of your ambitions as an individual, you, 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 you angel invest, you mentor, uh, but what outside of Hopper do you, do you want to give to so this I'm, community? I'm not 38, <laughs> just to make that clear. Um, right now, and I think for the rest of my, my, my professional life, it's all climate right now. Everything I'm doing through my family office is climate. We're looking at a bunch of other things. And this is a conversation that will not fit in the 21 seconds we have left. But um, I think there's a whole other conversation to have around um, the impending catastrophe that we're staring down. And um, I'm talking to a lot of people in software and in finance, um, you know, that have made a lot of money. And, you know, my question to everybody is like, what's the point of all this wealth if you're going to watch the world, the, the, the world burn down, right? Which is literally what's trying to happen. Um, so that's my answer. And if you want to reinvite me, Okay, um, we'll do it. I will, and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll bring Dax because that's yes, his yes, uh, he's... passion as well, a fellow Montreal or entrepreneur. 
we'll open up to questions. I can't really see anyone, so uh, perfect. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of your investors. You're pretty famous for having a very different kind of workforce, fully <laughs> distributed. And, yes. Uh, so yes. it started in the Boston scenario. So can you talk a bit about that and how it works? Because it's not frequent. Yeah, we run the weirdest model ever. So um, we don't have uh, any HR. We don't have a CTO. We don't have a CMO. We don't have a CRO. We have no functions except finance and legals embedded. And so this is something called single threaded ownership that was sort of invented at Amazon. And we, we took it like we put it on steroids or crack even. And that's how we <laughs> built up. And so Hopper works where um, we call them leaders. So somebody runs air, somebody runs price freeze. They have full hire and fire over everybody. They own their part of the PL. We have no functions, no matrix. And then um, so basically, you're putting a very high bar for leadership. People are allowed to build whatever they want. We, we have competitive initiatives. We don't coordinate. And then this is the part that makes everybody gasp. We actively prohibit communication in the company. We, we basically don't allow collaboration, communication. Um, we call these C words. <laughs> like, and what we found is what you're doing there is that you're, you're taking a big organization, there's 2,000 of us, and we have about 1,000 people in core product and tech, and you're turning it into 51 startups, and you're making a bet on a leader. The same thing that you try to do in, in, in Portage. And so, again, this is longer than the one minute and 36 <laughs> seconds that's on that counter. But fundamentally, if you prohibit communication, what you're doing is you're forcing people to build infrastructure. And my personal belief is the model we use to run companies today with the C-suite and all that, it was designed when we had factories. And if you have a, a chain and you're taking in raw materials and building a car and, and people have to coordinate and communicate, right? But if it's a purely virtual thing where I can invent a loot box and make a million dollars in 20 minutes, you don't need that. And what I submit as the evidence of this is all the software that's running your computer and your phone was written by a bunch of nerds that never talked to each other. That's the very definition of open source, right? And what people have forgotten is good software is written by small, very, very focused teams. And nobody had the guts to do it except a couple of, there's a couple of companies that run this way. And I, I have a whole speech I give on this. You can see our revenue going parabolic the day we adopted this model. And there's nothing we do that makes any sense. If you look at us from the outside, it looks like Lord of the Flies. Um, but it, I'm 100% sure it works better than any traditional model. Maybe one last question. Where's the company going? The Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure we're gonna be if not the largest travel marketplace and, and technology provider in the world. Um, I mean, Booking's a formidable company. It's very well run. Um, so, you know, maybe we end up their size. Airbnb has a good advantage, but I think we'll be up there. Um, we're probably destined to be public. I hate being public. I love private, um, you know, for all the reasons that we just realized this year. Um, and I think that, you know, we'll, we're closing on a billion of revenue. You know, I'm kind of chasing Toby. I feel like he did a good job. He kind of set the bar for the rest of us. So we're kind of aiming for something in that range. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I think this is the closing session. So really appreciate uh, everyone hanging around. Thanks, thanks, thanks. That was great. That was fun. Thank you.